because I'm afraid. There we go. All right. The box will go away in a second. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Well, hello, everybody. Hello from Pretoria, South Africa. Um, my name is uh, Joe Burnham, and uh, I'm a pastor who, uh, before the past couple months, uh, served in Denver, Colorado for a number of years, um, doing church planting in a context there. And uh, I just lost my video. There we go. And. Uh, Everyone able to hear me? Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, a, I'm a, a, a pastor. I have served as a missionary in the urban context in the United States, uh, downtown Denver, Colorado. I'll be talking a little bit about my experiences there um, during the course of this presentation. And then for the past uh, three months, two and a half months now, or a little over two months, my family and I have been uh, traveling around Africa, and the last month, actually, we've been settled in uh, at Pretoria in South Africa, and um, over the course of, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long this is going to take, but we're going to talk about um, three things as, we, as I pull from experiences and reflections on this trip and thoughts about ministry in general. Um, I'm going to talk to you about pineapples, laundry, and trash cans. And uh, obviously, each of those things is uh, a little bit more than just what meets the eye. Um, give you a little bit more background on me. Um, my wife, uh, I said, we've been traveling around. My wife, Anita, um, of almost uh, nine years, uh, is here with me. And then also our uh, three-and-a-half-year-old son, Robbie, who has been quite the adventurer and uh, amazing traveler on this trip. Uh, people told us that we were absolutely insane taking a three-year-old with us to Africa for almost four months, and um, he has turned out to be quite the little adventurer, and uh, we'll get a picture of him in the, in the course of, of his presentation as well. So there's a little bit of background on me, and uh, are we, how are we doing on that file? Let me, About two minutes. Oh, it says it's not done sending yet. I don't even have it. It still says it's about two minutes. About 0.9 megabytes. So beyond that, I have also, uh, along with Pastor Dale, helped uh, co-host CrossFeed News a few times. And so if you are familiar with that program, you might have seen my uh, internet face before, my networked face. Um, so yeah, there, there's the basics on me. Why don't we go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and say a prayer. And by the time I uh, finish praying, then um, we should have this file downloaded and ready to open up so you guys can get both the, uh, the visual portion that way as well as uh, the audio and some visual of me uh, sitting here in an office in South Africa. Pastor Dale, you want to do the prayer or would you like me to? That's fine. I got it. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for opportunities uh, to share your message of love, your, your salvation, um, not only in our own community, in our own context, but uh, for the opportunity to, to bring that message uh, through all the various means that you provide into the world. There are so many people in the world that do not know your love. Maybe they've experienced it um, in a way that it wasn't really your love, but it was something that was just labeled as such. Uh, or it could be that they just haven't heard the message of salvation yet. And so uh, we pray that you give us those opportunities, and we thank you uh, that you have shown that love to us and given us the assurance of your love, your presence with us, and the promise of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, and you didn't pray long enough. What's that? 
You didn't pray long enough. Oh, <laughs> oh he prays long enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time in your pastoral life you'll hear that comment, so I figured I'd better get it in. There we go. Opening. Okay, so uh, if anybody's watching this after the fact, um, we the recording, because of some technical problems we had, um, the recording will just see uh, Pastor Joe's face and not the, uh, the presentation. So, um, but for the benefit of those who are here, we can still play the presentation. If my computer ever decides. So my apologies to those who are watching after the fact, because you just have to look at me. <laughs> there we go. So, am I at the first? I'm not sure. Okay, what Should is it? Pineapples, laundry, and trash cans. All right. Oh, I'm down at the end. All right, so you just have to tell me when to advance it. Yeah, I'll go ahead and right. do it as I go ahead. So, go ahead. So, yeah, pineapples, laundry, and trash cans: reflections from Africa on ministry and the Christian life. And uh, obviously, pineapples, laundry, and trash cans. Well, I'm going to talk to you about each of those things today. They they symbolize something greater, uh, and they talk about something more, and, and lead us into a place where we can think about. Um, our, ourselves as, as Christians, as people who share the good news, um, both at, at home and abroad. Um, a lot of the things that you're going to hear today tie not only into ministry here in Africa over the last number of months, but, but flow out of experiences from before uh, when I was in downtown Denver. And so, um, but before we get there, I want to give you sort of a, a brief overview of uh, what we've been doing for the last two months plus a little bit. So, uh, Pastor Dale, if you could go to the next slide. And uh, in January, we, we, we took a journey. Um, our, our initial plan when we came out here, um, I was supposed to start a doctoral program, a doctor of ministry program in Nairobi, Kenya in January. And so we had set it up. So in early January, we were landing in Nairobi. And then we were leaving in late January from Nairobi to come to South Africa uh, to teach at uh, the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Swane, where I am now. Uh, about two weeks before we left, three weeks before we left, I got word from George Fox uh, Seminary in Portland that because they couldn't find enough qualified students, our doctoral program was delayed. And so we had tickets to Nairobi and on to Johannesburg, but nothing really to do in Nairobi for a month. And so we sort of thought, well, what can we do um, to make the most of this experience? And I have a, a friend uh, in West Africa who's been church planting there. He's from there, uh, came over to the United States. We were in seminary together, and we thought, well, why don't we go and, and see him? And in the process of deciding to see him, we ended up on, on a little bit of an unknown and unexpected but uh, unique adventure. And so on the next slide, uh, we, we began uh, January in, in Nairobi. Um, Nairobi is uh, officially considered um, East Africa. It's sort of East Central Africa. You can see the star there. It's, it's down fairly close to Lake Victoria. Uh, it's on part of the border between Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and I forget the fourth country. Um, in our initial stint in Nairobi, we actually stayed in um, what they call one of the estates. It's essentially one of the slums of Nairobi. It's one of the places where they tell you not to go if you're an American. And so we ended up spending two nights there with family. Um, the picture down in the bottom right is that's exactly what we saw um, while we were there, large buckets to gather water on the tops of buildings, um, mishmashed, just sort of scaled together concrete buildings, not very stable, huge numbers of people crammed into very small spaces. Um, in the home that we were staying in, uh, it was a, a husband and a wife who had two children, 
and then they were watching six orphans who also lived in their home. So a small uh, two-bedroom apartment with 10 people living inside of it. Um, and so people just crammed in, people everywhere. Um, poverty, uh, in unemployment rates in the 80% range. Um, just astronomical um, struggle and, and challenge in those places. And so we spent a few days there and uh, just had a chance to, to live with the people, to soak in some of, of, the, of the context and, and the culture, um, saw an amazing amount of love but amongst these people that had so little, which was, was a beautiful thing to see. Um, but there were also some other lessons that we, we pulled out of that as well. Uh, but before we get there, uh, jump to the next slide, and we have a picture. Um, we flew over to uh, Lome, Togo, which is where my friend is uh, originally from and is being a pastor. It is in West Africa, um, right next to Ghana. It's one of the smallest and one of the poorest countries in Africa. Um, it's also a place where things appeared a lot more African than they did in, uh, in, in Nairobi. We had, as you can see in the picture, uh, people were walking around with stuff balancing on their heads everywhere. Um, much more of the African dress than we ran into in Nairobi. Um, but again, the same kind of, of poverty that we experienced. Um, the same struggle and, and economic challenge. Um, horrible roads, uh, difficult living conditions. Um, just very much impoverished and struggling. And yet, again, people very welcoming, very loving, um, and, and embracing visitors. Uh, and so we felt um, truly welcome when we were there and we enjoyed We had almost two and a half weeks uh, with this friend of mine and with his family, and we were able to support the church there. Um, it's unique because they speak French there, uh, because it's, it's French West Africa. And so when I preached on a Sunday morning, I preached in English, my friend preached in French, and then a third guy preached in Ebe, which is one of the local languages. And so we had a, a triple translation going on um, with the sermon. Uh, the next slide, uh, the easiest way to get to uh, West Africa from Nairobi is through Ethiopian Airlines, and in order to do it, you have to spend a night in Ethiopia. And so we figured, why not spend one night, let's spend three. And so we uh, spent a little bit of time in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, um, which is, uh, as you can see in the star, uh, it's actually considered now North Africa. Um, it's just a little bit north of Kenya. Um, very different from any other country in Africa. Um, Ethiopia is one of the poorest, and yet it is, uh, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later as we get into the idea of trash cans, because it was what we experienced there that prompted that whole piece of this presentation. And, and when we come to the last slide, uh, or the next slide, we um, then flew south from Nairobi down to uh, South Africa. And if we jump one more slide, uh, you can see that South Africa is, is completely different from anything else. Um, south Africa is, in, in many places, at least in the urban areas, very Western. Uh, the picture you see, that is the city that we are in right now. We are in Pretoria. It is, it is urban. It is two and a half million people. It is uh, just a little ways north of Johannesburg, which is about four and a half million people. Um, they're expecting by 2020, I believe, for Pretoria, Johannesburg, and other surrounding um, cities and communities to develop into a population of about 14 million people. Um, which will make it one of the largest metropolises, if not the largest metropolis in uh, Africa. So rapidly developing, rapidly growing, a lot of construction, um, especially with the World Cup is going to be hosted in uh, Johannesburg, or the, it'll be the, the primary city um, in just a few months. There's an incredible amount of construction and development and light rail and urbanization happening. Um, and yet it's still... Africa, and there's still a huge gap um, between the white population, the white minority population, and the black majority population. Um, even though we, uh, the, the country, it's 20 years now since Nelson Mandela was released from prison. Um, it's 20 years since apartheid began to be deconstructed. It's 16 years since Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. Um, the nation is still in a place where Whites make five times as much as blacks. 
Um, and so there's a very long process of trying to help the black population come out of the oppression that they experienced for hundreds of years. Um, and so that's just a little sort of an overview of where we've been um, and what we've experienced in the past couple of months, uh, which, which set the stage, if you go to the next slide, for the presentation. Uh, pineapples, laundry, and trash cans. And so the first thing I really want to talk to you about uh, tonight, or this afternoon, I guess, for you, is uh, pineapples. And if you'll go one more slide, uh, pineapples. It's, it's sort of an odd thing when you think about it to be at a Christian presentation talking about pineapples, but I had this really interesting experience. Um, in the United States, you would buy a pineapple, you go to Hawaii and you get a pineapple, and they have this, this large base. And, and it, it is, it's really sort of a, a unique and beautiful fruit, a big round base that narrows towards the top. It has this perfect shape to it. And when you, when you cut it open, there's this, this wonderful yellow color. And, and, it, and it looks good, and it's appealing to the eye, and, and they taste good as well. At least I thought they did. Until I tried an African pineapple. And uh, an, an African pineapple, it's, it's really ugly when you get it. It's almost like this sort of rough, odd, callous, tube-shaped thing. And, and, and you cut it open, and, and the fruit inside, it's, it's white. And, it, and it's unattractive, and it doesn't look all that appealing to us. And yet, it's so much sweeter. And, and instead of having to cut out the core in the middle, you eat it, and it's like eating sugar cane. And it's got this wonderful pineapple flavor wrapped in this sweetness, and it, it's just this amazing taste on the tongue. And I sat there, and I thought, this is unbelievable. A, a pineapple grown in the United States, which has been cultured and designed and engineered and, and modified and reworked to be the most appealing thing to the eye doesn't taste nearly as good as, as the ugly, ragged, scraggly, white African pineapple that's just grown and picked. And I began to think, you know, that's sort of like this experience I had with the gospel when I was in, when I was in Nairobi. I went to this, this church while we were there, and the pastor's a nice enough guy, and, and he's loving, and he loves his people, and he cares about people, and he wants what's best for his church. But his teaching was horrible. We sat there, and, and, and he opened up Genesis, and, and he started talking about how Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then he said, see, Abraham was a righteous man. And so you must be righteous too, so God will bless you. He missed the entire book of what Genesis was talking about. And while he talked about the gospel, and while he talked about Jesus, it was, it was coded in this, you've got to do this stuff in order to make God happy. And it was all over Kenya. We, we turned on the TV, and we're sitting there watching this show, and they're, they're speaking in Swahili, so I couldn't understand it, but I'm watching the guy on the screen, and I'm looking at the background around him, and I'm listening to his, his, his animation and the sound in his voice and his gestures, and I'm thinking, No. This isn't what I think it is. And sure enough, a few moments later, in English, it popped up on the bottom of the screen. Send in your ten requested blessings from God, along with 625 Kenyan shillings, and we will pray for you. It was the very first of... American evangelical pop Christianity translated into the, the Kenyan context. And I saw the same thing in, in Ghana, and I saw it in, in Togo, and I've heard it in South Africa. And I've seen it all over the place in the United States. There's 
this gospel that's manipulated and twisted and reworked to become appealing to people. Because let's face it, we want to do something. We want to contribute something to the, the, the equation. We want to do something where we show it to God and say, see this wonderful thing that I've done, God? Now you can love me. Now you can be happy with me. See how I've earned your blessings. We as people want to do something so God will love us. And so we manipulate the gospel and end up with something that loses the sweetness of Christ has done it all for you. If you could kick to the next slide, Pastor Neil. I have a, a scripture reading here from Galatians 1.9 that says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And while we as Christians, we want to work together with everybody. We want everybody to connect and come together, and, and we want to all be one as the church. There's, there's also this reality that we have different slants and different angles on the gospel and ways of expressing it. And, and some people take that which is pure and wonderful, true, and manipulate it so it's attractive to people and yet loses its sweetness as opposed to a gospel that says you have nothing to offer God, you can't make him love you, you can't do anything except receive Jesus. Receive the fact that he loves you and he's drawing you to himself. He wants you just to acknowledge you can't do anything, but cling to him by faith. And it doesn't look as good. And yet when you grasp it, it's the sweetest thing that you could imagine. And I think the reason that Paul adds this let him be a curse thing at the end of it isn't one of these sort of I'm right and they're wrong kind of things. Rather it's a this is really what's best for people when they receive the pure gospel as opposed to something that's been twisted and manipulated. When I was working in downtown Denver it was a neighborhood that was 4% Christian. And so 96% of the people that I ran into on a day-to-day -day basis did not believe the same things that I believed in. And as I talked to them over time, one of the things I learned is that most of them had some sort of Christian background. But it had always been a Christian background where they heard about all of the stuff that they needed to do to please God. And they heard about all of the, see, Abraham was righteous, and therefore you need to be righteous too. Or it was the, if you pray hard enough and believe hard enough, then God will give you these blessings. And if you don't receive these blessings or these healings or whatever it is you're asking for, it's because you don't believe enough. And so these people, story after story after story, had left the church because they had come to the conclusion that either they couldn't have enough faith or God didn't love them. They'd heard a gospel that wasn't pure. It was tainted with something else, maybe to make it look better from a human perspective, at least initially, but, but in the end, when everything carried out, it turned into something ugly in their own lives. And I was left in this place of over long conversations with people, slowly and gently and lovingly revealing the ugly African pineapple of a gospel that Scripture gives us and giving them something pure and true as opposed to what they'd experienced growing up. And it was amazing when it finally sunk in to watch lives be changed as people tasted the true sweetness of the gospel. And that's actually one of the reasons that I'm so excited right now to be serving at uh, the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Swami. This is a school where we have students from all over the African continent. In my classes, I have Liberians, I have Nigerians, I have Ugandans, I have Sudanese, I have Ethiopians, I have 
uh, a guy from Zimbabwe. We have people from Botswana, from South Africa, from Zambia. We have guys from all over the African continent who have, have struggled to come down here and, and to focus four years of their life diving into and studying and exploring theology so that they can take the gospel in its purest form that we can imagine back to their people. So people across the continent who are hearing this twisted, changed, impure version of the gospel, a gospel that, that is no gospel at all because it says you have to do something to make God love you, they can hear the good news of what Jesus has done for them. And so it's been just an amazing joy to sit here and, and work with those who have just arrived and are just beginning their theological study, as well as those who are getting ready to head out in the next year as pastors, and, and to work with them as they seek to figure out how to faithfully proclaim the gospel to the lives of the people in Africa. But there's something more to it. If we go on to the next slide, we can see that we also have to talk about laundry. Because like, for those people when I was in downtown Denver, most of them, because they'd had this horrible experience with the church in the past, they weren't ready to just sit down and talk to a pastor. And in fact, when they first met me, uh, most of them, if they found out I was a pastor too soon, would respond either by running away and avoiding conversation with me, or by arguing with me about all of the horrible things that the church had done. Something needed to happen to prepare them to be ready to engage with me in conversation on the gospel. And oddly enough, as we go to the next slide, that's what um, laundry is really all about. Laundry uh, actually initiated in Togo. It was uh, a day when Anita, my wife, was absolutely exhausted. Um, we were out of clean clothes, and so laundry had to be done. And so she asked me if I would go out and do the laundry. Um, we don't have washing machines here, or we didn't. We have them here in Pretoria. We didn't have them anywhere else um, on our travels. Instead, you get buckets, and you put soap in the bucket, and you scrub it out by hand, and you twist, and you work it, and then you move it into a rinse, and you move it into another rinse, and you hang it up on a line to dry. And so I went out and started getting all of the buckets ready and brought out the pile of laundry and pulled a chair and went over to sit down. And all of a sudden, the house girl, who doesn't speak English, she only speaks Eve, came charging out at me, yelling, no, 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 no. And she shooed me away from the laundry and insisted on doing it herself. Because in that culture and in that place, laundry is woman's work. And so for a guy to be doing laundry was completely unacceptable. Needless to say, I was a little bit shocked because I come from a life and a background where I used to come home from college and I would bring in the laundry, and my mom would look at me and say, great, ours is downstairs, you can wash that too. <laughs> and so here, all of a sudden, they're used to having to do the laundry, I'm shooed away from it. It was just one of, of any experiences of culture shock that we've had. Let me go to the next slide, we have a, a couple pictures here. For example, in the top right, it was a little bit shocking the first time I went to eat dinner and discovered that my fish was looking back at me. And more than that, it was interesting to find out that my fish still had bones in it. And that most of the time, the Togolese don't bother to pick the bones out. They just eat them. In fact, we had this interesting day where I finished eating my meal. And I looked down at my plate and everything was clear. And I looked over at Anita's plate and saw a pile of bones. And I said, huh, I wondered why the fish were crunchy. I guess I'm turning Togolese. 
There was also a bit of culture shock the time that we had to take a shower. And if you look on the bottom right, you can see the shower implements in Togo. You get one bucket to fill up and one bucket to pour and rinse. And so you pour the water over yourself, you soap up, and you rinse off. In South Africa, the, it's been a little bit different in that uh, it's a little more of a civilized challenge, namely that it was England who colonized South Africa. And therefore, the steering wheel is on the right side of the car and you drive on the left side of the street, which was quite the interesting experience yesterday when I was driving through Soweto, a part of South Africa that many Africans refuse to drive through because of the traffic and the drivers and how things work. And so here I am in some of the worst traffic in the world. The traffic is hectic, and I'm on the wrong side of the car, driving on the wrong side of the road with a stick shift. It was a little bit shocking, a little bit unnerving, a little bit uncomfortable. But probably the most uncomfortable thing for us actually happened when we were in Ethiopia. Because there, it was no big deal as we would walk by with Robbie in our arms, for the Ethiopians to just grab onto him and pull him to check out this little white child because they'd never seen one before. But it, it, it was terrifying to Anita and I as parents to have some strange adult just grab our child. And obviously it was quite scary for Robbie as well. Although in other contexts, he got quite used to it. He's become quite the tourist attraction, as you can see in that photo on the left. This is at a church in Ethiopia where he went outside and instantly had kids, four people deep, gathered around him, looking in, reaching out, touching his hair, kissing him on the cheeks. These, these people were just amazed by this little white child. And that's what brings us to the point of what all of this is about, this idea of, of laundry, this idea of culture shock, this having your world sort of turned upside down. It's, it's the fact that we as Christians should be like Robbie's in, in Ethiopia. We should prompt the world around us to not quite get us, to look at us and want to try and figure us out and understand us because we look like something totally new. We, in a sense, give the world around us culture shock. We go to the next slide, we have a, a scripture reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, and it says, Behold you, behold the love. I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Sojourners, travelers in a foreign land, Exiles, those living in a land which they do not belong, often against their will. That's how Peter describes Christian life. Describes us as people who live as, as foreigners. And as we do, it prompts the world around us to look at us and see something different. This is one of the things that I used when I was in downtown Denver. I said earlier to the people, if they found out I was a pastor too soon, refused to talk to me. And so one of the things I did to try and, and break down stereotypes is I became very involved in community service. Crime was a huge issue in my neighborhood and it had been for about 40 years. When we first moved into our condo, we couldn't make it from our front door to our car without somebody trying to sell us crack. We had prostitutes outside. It was, it was not a good neighborhood necessarily to, to live in. And we were a bit shocked right after we moved in when we found out that we were going to be parents. And so we decided to try and do something about the community that we lived in. And I started to work with, with civic groups and with, with governmental groups that were all working to address issues of crime in my neighborhood. And as we put forward effort and, and, and challenged the way that the culture had grown and we, 
we pressed for something new and different. Over a few years, we, we tangibly saw levels of crime decrease significantly. But as my neighbor saw me out cleaning up trash and scaring away drug dealers and being someone who was engaged in civic affairs and working for the benefit of the community, they began to look at me and say, there's something different about you. What, what would drive you to do this? I lived in a community where when I said I wanted to raise my child in Capitol Hill, people stood up and applauded. Because for years, families had abandoned the community and destabilized it. And so for me, standing there saying, this is something I want to do, I'm committed to this neighborhood, people were blown away. And the same people who initially ran away from me when they found out once I was a pastor began to come to me and ask me questions about my faith. They suddenly saw that it wasn't like what they'd experienced before. So they said, you're not a typical pastor. What's the deal? And I began to talk to them about my relationship with Jesus. And as we challenge Africans to go forth, as we challenge these young pastors to go forth, we're going to be challenging them to think about what they can do in their communities to set them apart from what the others experienced in the other churches. What can be done? How can their communities, their congregations live in such a way that, that people who, who are beginning to be beaten down by a, a modified gospel can look at them and say, what is it that's different about you? What do you know about Jesus that I have never heard before? So they too can be invited to experience the pure gospel. These works of living as a sojourner, as an exile. First Peter goes on to say that it sets up the opportunity to proclaim the wonders of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous life. Now, one of the best ways, if you go to the next slide, for us to begin to set the stage, for people to see something different in us, for us to cause people culture shock, so we have an opportunity to talk about the pineapple of the natural gospel. deals with trash cans. It deals with how we treat the poor, the oppressed, those how we treat those who are struggling in such a way that it doesn't just help them, but it also isn't demeaning to them. Let me expand on trash cans a little bit to help understand, understand what that means. When we were in Nairobi, we took a couple of tourist excursions. Uh, we had a driver during the day. And we were at this um, cultural center, and the driver had picked up a Coke somewhere during the day, and he finished his bottle of Coke. And as, as we walked down the street, he took his bottle and just chucked it into a field nearby. And Anita and I were a little thrown back and thought that that was rather strange. But then we noticed that there was a lot more trash laying in the field. And when we went to Togo, we had to land in Accra in Ghana and drive to Togo from there. And our driver from Accra to Lome picked up snacks, picked up a water bottle, picked up other items. And when he finished them, he just threw them out the window. And when we got to Lome, again, trash was everywhere. People just left trash laying wherever they finished using the item. And then we went to Ethiopia. And one of the first things we noticed was that it was clean. 
Unlike everywhere else we'd been, there were public trash cans out and available, and people were using them. And I began to wonder, what is it that results in Ethiopians using trash cans and not making a mess of their, their, their city and their land, whereas other places didn't seem to care? And as I talked to more and more Ethiopians, I realized that they are a very proud people. They have a, a strong sense of, of personal dignity and value. They have a sense of national pride because they have a 1,600-year Christian tradition in their country. They're also the one African nation that fought back and defeated attempts at colonialism. The only other nation in Africa to not experience colonization was Liberia, which was founded on slaves who had been released from the United States and brought back to Africa under the administration of, of President Monroe. There's something about Ethiopia where they had this sense of dignity and honor. And while they might be the poorest country, they are the country that is trying their hardest to work themselves out of the difficulty that they have found themselves in. And as I saw this, I, I realized that in other parts of Africa, the people have spent their entire history being beaten down. And they've come to a place where they just simply assume that they can't do anything and that they have no dignity left. And then leaving their trash everywhere, it's just one symbol of this much deeper problem. You think about it, there was colonialism. And extended periods of time, they were told that they were less than human and that they didn't have rights as people. Something that saw its absolute worst manifestation of apartheid government where blacks until just a few years ago weren't considered normal people in South Africa, even though they made up almost 80% of the population. Religion has been imported from Europe where all churches are controlled by outsiders. Everything exactly matches what is done in the European world, the Western world. Even the soccer coaches for the African football teams are from Europe. Any position of, of thoughtfulness, of, of the ability to pro solve problems, to take on the challenges that face the people, are handed over to whites. Because the blacks are simply in a space where they assume that they can't do it. And so often we seek and desire to help them. But in the process, we only further their loss of dignity. If you go to the next slide, we have a quote from James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, Brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food. And one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things that they needed for the body. What good is this? And what's interesting is while there's truth to this, we need to recognize the, the needs, the physical needs that people have and seek to serve and respond to them. It's also important for us to consider the greater needs of the people, not just the, the basic physical needs, but, but who they are as human beings and the place that they have found themselves in. Because often charity strip away dignity. We often saw this when we were in Denver. Groups would want to come and, and help feed the homeless. And so they would come out and they would set up stands on the side of the road and they would begin handing out sandwiches. And what they didn't realize is while they felt better about the service that they were engaged in, it actually did a lot of harm to the It furthered the trash problem. It helped the homeless, it encouraged them to remain on the streets rather than seeking out the services that would help them 
to, to get the skills that they needed to get off of the street. It perpetuated a negative cycle. It gave the drug dealers a place to hide in the midst of the homeless and to get the homeless engaged in the drug scene. While it served a basic need, it didn't consider the deeper underlying needs, which is something that we need to face when we're considering an issue in Africa as well. I was amazed at how quick people here began to talk to Westerners about the issue of money. The first host family in Nairobi that picked us up, we hadn't made it off of the airport grounds before this, this person that we had just met started talking to us about all of the money that he was hoping to acquire from people in the United States. And he was hoping that we would be the channel through which he would receive it. The assumption was is that in order for things to get done in Africa, it requires Western money. My friend in Togo, who I went to seminary with, it was, it was the same thing. He was always talking about the need for money from the West so they could build the church building that they wanted. Even students at the seminary, as they respond to technology and the financial, the reality that we're here, there's this constant assumption that unless the West funds it, it can't be done. And somehow, while it's important for us in the West to serve those in Africa, because they need a hand up, we have to figure out ways to do it without giving them a handout. Perhaps the best example is uh, also the group that I just pulled that phrase, a hand up rather than a handout from. It's Habitat for Humanity. I don't know how many of you know how Habitat works in the United States, but when you support Habitat for Humanity, what they do is they have an extended interview process to get people homes. And so they determine who is going to get a home and who isn't through this long interview process. Once they decide that you're qualified for a home, you are charged 25% of your monthly income until your mortgage is paid off. So it's a low interest loan, but you have to pay. And then, in addition, while your home is being built, the people who build the homes or who are going to live in the homes are required to put in, I think it's a hundred hours of personal work time on the home. Habitat refers to it as sweat equity. And the entire thing is built on the premise that if these people engage in the process of building their own home, if they engage in the process of buying their own home, then you're actually giving them an opportunity not only to get out of a place of poverty, but you're giving them an opportunity to develop a sense of pride and personal dignity that they wouldn't otherwise have. Something that poverty had stripped away from. And that's why it's important, I think, when we think about fund projects overseas, we always need to find out what's going on. Are we just giving money to a group that's going to spend it and then come asking for more when the next project comes? Or are we engaging in a project that seeks to lift Africans out of the place of despair, hopelessness that they found themselves in? Helping to give them a, a sense of, of pride, dignity, of value as people, a, a sense that they can actually accomplish and solve problems on their own. I think that's one of the things that I, I love about the fact that I'm serving here at the seminary. Because what are we doing? I'm not working with the masses here. I'm working with a select few to help them go and serve the masses. And I'm challenging the very students I have in class, the best and the brightest that I have in class, to go on and, and earn higher degrees beyond their base seminary education so someday they can be taking my job. And they can be the ones who are training Africans. And ultimately, those Africans can come to the United States and be trained Americans to be pastors. 
lifting people out of, of the difficulty that they have found themselves in, giving them that hand up so that they can do it, so that they have an opportunity to carry their country and their people. So, our last slide. Pineapples, laundry, and trash cans. It's about holding on to the natural gospel and living in such a way that prompts culture shock. And often our living in such a way that, that, that strikes people as different, coming up the way that we love and serve those who are in need. I think that not only addresses challenge in ministry, but it addresses the challenge of each and every one of our lives. How can we help those who are hurting up by giving them a hand up rather than a handout? How can we have an unbelieving world around us see the love that we show to the least in our society so that we have an opportunity to tell them about the wonderful purity of the gospel? Pineapples, long trash cans. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Uh, let's see. Let me zoom you out again. Right. Does anybody have any uh, questions? Thoughts? Anything else? Hannah? I don't know. What time is it there? Um, we are uh, seven hours ahead of you. It is 9.15, almost 9.15. Yep. So it's past your bedtime. Okay. Question is, what is the number one intellectual enemy of, of Christianity there? Is it, is it the false forms of Christianity, or is it other uh, religious concepts? Um, I, I think well, it, it depends where you are. Um, there's um, One of them is, is going to be the false forms of Christianity, which often also comes in with a a marriage between the traditional religions, uh, animism, with Christianity, and so they sort of wed them together, um, which means that you do all of your rites and rituals sort of as a way to please the gods, um, which is essentially what animism is all about. You do your rites and your rituals, and that, that pleases the gods, um, which then results in them having to give you what you want. Um, in other parts of Africa, especially in the north, um, the biggest threat to Christianity is Islam. Uh, Ethiopia is experiencing um, strong attacks from Islam. Uh, the northern part of Sudan is controlled largely by Islamist extremists. Um, we have one of our students here, he's from South Sudan. And he was talking about his um, perception and experience with Darfur. And he said, really what he sees going on there is you have both Muslims and Christians who want um, religious freedom being attacked and oppressed by uh, an Islamic leadership that refuses to allow anything other than Islam to survive. And so all of the ugliness that we see and we hear about Darfur, that's what's going on. Um, in his account. Uh, he said essentially northern Sudan and southern Sudan, they have their own governments, they function completely independently, they are two different countries in everything but name, one predominantly Christian, one predominantly Muslim. Um, Islam's also fairly potent in West Africa or an increasing ground in West Africa. And so they're um, being very aggressive uh, on the continent. So that would be a, a threat and a challenge um, that we hear quite a bit about, especially from the students who are from further north. Okay. Other questions? 
I have one. Um, since you're in South Africa right now, you talked about apartheid uh, coming to an end and, and that. Um, now, we in the United States um, are sort of uh, years ahead of them in a sense of, of dealing with the whole human rights uh, issue, racism, and things like that. Um, now, I know legally they're working on, on helping out uh, the black majority. What are attitudes like there? It's, it's interesting. There's, there's sort of two worlds going on right now. Um, you have a large group of the population where there is, there is a great acceptance. There is a great um, inclusivity. Um, there is a, a great welcoming um, of whites and blacks and a love and respect between all sides. We, uh, here on the seminary campus, a mixed congregation meets. Um, and so you have whites and blacks serving together. They just uh, did their, their elections. And while it's majority a black congregation, we had um, two blacks and a white on the, on the church council. And so there's this, it was just a marker that I noticed this morning of, of, a, uh, of an acceptance that's going on in this community. It's a beautiful thing. Um, one of the things I think that South Africa has done incredibly well, I, I saw this. Um, when visiting the Apartheid Museum, uh, just yesterday I was down there, I was down in Soweto, which used to be one of the, the world's largest ghettos. Um, they have done a, a beautiful job on one side of, of the whites acknowledging what happened. There is not a denial of the atrocity that was committed. And on the other side, the blacks have said, yes, you did this to us, but there is going to be forgiveness and reconciliation, and we are going to work towards that. Um, <laughs> was one of the things that, that absolutely amazed me as I went through the Apartheid Museum and, and reading, and I pulled a couple of quotes. Um, one of them was uh, Nelson Mandela. I'm trying to remember what he said. It was something to the effect of, of, of freedom is not just about releasing your own personal bonds but it's living in a, such a way that assures and enables the freedom of others. Um, there was a, a, one of the guys that was talking in one of the videos talked about uh, that the, the struggle by the black majority was not just freedom from the blacks from their oppression, but freedom for the whites from their fear. And so there was, um, under the leadership of, of, of Mandela and others, there was a very strong reconciliation kind of tone, which really sought to, to say, okay, yes, these things happen, um, but we're going to move beyond that, and together we're going to make a stronger South Africa. And so there really is a, there is a fair amount of that. Um, at the same time, there's, there's the reality that it's 20 years since Mandela was released from prison just about a month ago. Just a month ago, we celebrated that. I don't know how well that hit the, the news in the U.S. Um, but it was 16 years ago that he was elected into office, but the schools still aren't rehabbed, and, and there's still a lot of ghetto, and there's still high unemployment rates, and, and whites still make five times more than blacks. And so there's still a, a, an undercurrent in, in the black community is very high in crime. Um, we had our house broken into one night while we slept here. And uh, I, I'm amazingly using a laptop that was stolen that night. And then through an odd set of circumstances, it was returned to me. Um, the other one is we had here was gone. We never saw that one again. Um, so there's this undercurrent and there is this sense of, of fighting to, to in, in some ways sort of a Robin Hood uh, equalize the system kind of justice. Um, but on the whole, it's given what happened and how recently it happened, in many ways I think South Africa is actually ahead of the United States. Okay. So, uh, And that's my experience is having some time in um, North St. Louis, East St. Louis, uh, some of those places. Uh, and, and even talking to the white community in St. Louis and their reaction towards the black community in St. Louis. Um, I saw a much more heavy-handed heavy and, and, and blatant racism there 
um, than anything I've experienced so far in South Africa. Okay, anybody else? All right, Pastor Burnham, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I just want to encourage all of you, um, as people wherever you are, um, whether it's, you know, as, as a community wanting to support foreign missions, to, to seek out those projects that, that really help to enable and lift um, people who are, uh, have been oppressed or who are, are, are beaten and broken and downtrodden to help lift them up and, and, and restore their, their dignity and the sense of identity and the value that they have because of who Jesus is and what he has done for them. Um, I encourage you to do it in, in your own community there. Um, Habitat for Humanity is a wonderful organization to volunteer with, and I would encourage you to check them out if you don't have any other mission work right in your community there. Um, I would encourage you to, to think about how you can live out your faith right there in, in, in Cleveland um, in such a way that it, it prompts your, your non-believing neighbors to, to look at you guys and, and wonder what makes you different. Give people culture shock. Throw them for a loop and make them wonder what you're all about. And um, while we love churches being united together, um, I encourage you not to do it at the expense of the gospel, but to seek to, to share the, the beauty and the fullness of the gospel as, as, as we Lutherans have it in, in a way that, that's beyond anything that I've run into anywhere else. Um, hold on to that. Proclaim that. Share that. Give that freely to people and, and, and celebrate in, in the amazing grace that Jesus has for you and for me. Right. Would you like to close us out in prayer? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, I, I praise you for these, uh, these people who have gathered here today to join me. And I, I praise you for the, uh, the wonders of technology that even though it didn't work as we expected, it enabled us to have this time together and that I can sit there here 10,000 miles away and have a conversation with people in Cleveland. We celebrate the way that your son brings people together, people who cross ethnic boundaries, racial boundaries, language barriers, uh, cultures and experiences and places in life, the way that your son draws us all together and you call us your people. Father, be with, be with this congregation. Bless them in their ministry. Guide them, lead them, direct them. Help them to carry forth the purity of your gospel. Help them to shock the world around them as, they, as the world around them sees love in them that they don't see other places. Help them to reach out to those who are oppressed and to lift them up in such a way that it restores dignity and value in human life. Father, watch over them in all that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. So God be with you and uh, your continued work there. And uh, when, the, when the time comes that may bring you back Safely. Yes, we're, uh, we're, we're looking forward to that journey back as much as we're loving our time here. We um, we'll, should be back in the States in April. So. All right. Well, take God care. Be with you. All right. Bye. Bye.